Tibet recently exploded in violent protests that spread across the country and into Tibetan communities in neighboring provinces. The protests were sparked by demonstrations against the arrest of Buddhist monks in the capital, Lhasa. The Chinese crackdown was swift. Foreign media were banned and troops secured the streets. The government blamed refugees abroad and Tibet's exiled spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, who has long advocated a policy of non-violence for masterminding the unrest. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, some kind of cultural genocide is taking place. Tibetan refugees in London and around the globe seized the opportunity to show the world the other side of the smiling face China is presenting publicly in the run-up to the Olympics. Chinese people are sending troops, killing people, but to the media, to the world, they are say, just saying they are doing nothing. These protests highlighted one of the longest-running human rights disputes in the world. Last year, Tash Despa, a Tibetan refugee, now a British resident, returned to his homeland. He spent three months undercover, traveling the country to find out what life was like for ordinary ethnic Tibetans under Chinese rule. He found a highly militarized state, which is imprisoning and torturing dissenters. <laughs> Women suffering forced abortions and sterilizations. <laughs> and Tibet's traditional nomadic way of life under threat as thousands are forcibly resettled. <laughs> Ten years ago, Tash Despa escaped across the Himalayas. He paid a guide 75 pounds, three months average salary, and left his family behind, unable to see a future in a country increasingly dominated by the Chinese. Where we're walking to, there are uh, lots of frozen bodies. Sometimes you can see the feet, sometimes you can see the face. When you see the face, it's really scary. You know, some, some eyes opening, the mouth was opening. And uh, I've never seen a body like that before. And uh, I was really scared and thought, oh my God, maybe one day this is going to be me. It turned out that he was one of the lucky ones. They're shooting them like dogs. Every year, an estimated 3,000 Tibetans make the dangerous crossing through the Himalayas into Nepal, then India, to escape life under Chinese control. On September the 30th, 2006, 75 refugees, including 13 children, were attempting the month-long trek. Some Western climbers were filming when Chinese border guards spotted the group. <laughs> By now, the group had been split. Lob Sang, who was at the rear with the children, saw the troops starting to shoot at those just yards in front of him. One shot proved fatal.
Lobsang was able to reach the western climbers. Don't worry, we'll go, we'll go and bring you clothes and you'll come into the kitchen, okay? Like a cook, right? Stay here. The Chinese guard searched the camp, but didn't find him. Later, he was able to escape into Nepal. Jam Yang was arrested along with the children and taken back to Tibet, where he alleges he was imprisoned, interrogated, and tortured. After three months, Jam Yang was released and made another attempt to escape Tibet, this time successfully. Both he and Lob Sang eventually made it to the refugee center where Tash tracked them down. But as Lob Sang explained, freedom has come at a price. <laughs> Since 1959, the government in exile has been based in Dharamsala, northern India, now the first port of call for all Tibetan refugees. It was familiar to Tash as well. You know, 11 years ago, I was here too, and uh, I stayed here like six or seven days. There's hundreds of beds uh, people have to share, but uh, it is really important to the refugees because they have got nowhere to go. This is the place. I slept over there, just down there, a few beds down, and uh, it just feels strange, you know, to be here again. Ale, Kadipa? But making it past the border guards is not the only danger refugees must overcome. Few are prepared for the harsh conditions they face on the journey. They are working for one month, some are one and a half month by foot. I work here at the reception center for 13 years, so I saw a lot of frostbite. Uh, one group, they had 15 people get frostbite. They don't have any hospital on the way, you know. So if it is very bad, they can't, they can't do it anything, you know. They need to do amputation. Because they claim the only other way to escape involves costly and dangerous bribes, thousands now make this treacherous journey. It is estimated that there are over 200,000 Tibetans living in exile. A group of 24 refugees who had just crossed the border agreed to be interviewed. Some were fleeing religious persecution, others wanted an education, but they all wanted their faces hidden and their voices distorted as they feared retribution on their families back in Tibet.
One refugee who was prepared to have his face shown used to be a farmer and said he was a strong supporter of Tibetan independence. The last time there were mass riots in Tibet was in 1989. In response, China imposed martial law. In the weeks that followed, the US Congress and the European Parliament condemned the shooting of many unarmed protesters as China used lethal force to crush all dissent. Since then, Beijing has rigidly controlled reporting from Tibet. The shooting on the pass was one of the few times that Westerners have witnessed the killing of Tibetans, an incident the Chinese later described as self-defense. This is the glacier leading to the Nampala Pass, where the shooting took place. I've learned a lot from the survivors from the shooting, and now I want to go back to Tibet and find out why these people take risk to leave. Tash Desper has returned to Tibet for the first time since he escaped 10 years ago. His plan is to live here undercover for three months to see what life is like really for ordinary Tibetans. But in attempting to report on the realities of Tibet under Chinese rule, even with a British passport, he is risking imprisonment if he is caught. There must be a reason why people take the risk to cross the Himalaya to get to India. Uh, so I'm on the way to meet an uh, ex-political prisoner. I've been traveling for 10 hours now and to get a safe place to talk to him. One of the first things the team noticed was an overwhelming military presence. This army convoy was several miles long. Tash had arranged to meet a man who had warned him it would be very risky to attempt to report undercover on life in Tibet. A campaigner for Tibetan rights, he has direct experience of how the state uses all means possible to monitor anyone who questions China's rule. Rungun 
The team knew that filming anything, particularly the police, was extremely risky, but it was essential to document just how heavily policed the streets of Tibet have become. In a safe location on a roof, Tash revealed that the reality of his plan to live undercover for three months was already taking its toll. This morning, truth? Yeah, 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 the truth. I've been vomiting in the room as well. Sorry? I've been vomiting. You've been vomiting? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Very nervous. Ne never happened this before in my life. Do you think you can still do this? Yes, I guess you to do it. Hey. Many Tibetans have traditionally existed as nomads. But in the four decades since the occupation, the Chinese have increasingly tried to control this way of life. The government says it is improving the living conditions of nomads and will provide 52,000 with homes in 2008. But according to a Human Rights Watch report last year, many tens of thousands of Tibetans have been forcibly resettled and had their land and livestock confiscated. Pressure groups say that living conditions for nomads in the resettlement camps are grim. To investigate this, the team drove to a camp built in the middle of an empty plain many miles from the nearest town. This is the houses of the nomads' families who are moved from the grassland. And uh, I hear that there's uh, 20 families right here now. Live here, it's like a little prison, isn't it? Look. It's really sad. The camp has been occupied for nearly two years, but there are no public buses in or out, so the people here have little chance to travel to find work. There is no school or clinic, and with little support for retraining, the nomads are struggling to survive. As a result, alcoholism is becoming more and more of a problem. Okay, we should go. Okay. Yeah. I think it's no good to speak to anybody. Why is that? Because... I know he doesn't trust him. So it's not possible to go in any of yeah. the houses? No. So they're just fenced in behind these concrete walls, is that? Yeah. No, my book. The driver's increasing anxiety was justified when the team spotted four police cars parked watching the camp. It shows you how close it's uh, always to be caught. It was clearly too risky to try to talk to anyone here, so the team drove to another nomad resettlement camp a couple of hours away. This time, Tash went in alone, wearing a secret camera. Although there was a noticeable police presence here too, Tash was confident that he could blend in with the locals and felt it was worth taking the risk to talk to some directly. One woman who'd been forcibly resettled from the grasslands felt so strongly about the situation of her people that she agreed to be interviewed. 
，弄错就不行。啊，多么的是苦，啊，你个你个你上面个花香，要再要再过上面个，大哥就好大东东叫。ना तो गाँक में एक कली से गाँक में ताँचे चीज़ तो नहीं थी वो ताँचे में तेरा वो जाला जो कुंतल रुचि चासन तो क्या था उनकी मार्ग पे शायद वो राज्य से किर तो जेब गोजी चुम ऐसे चल नहीं रहे मत चुम चाकू कंगे दार को बोलते हैं जो जिस के यहाँ का चाय के जो सेम कर लोनी तो तो ना सेम थानी का � Mari nak cili tang, cuma madam nak cili tang, rumi saja cium buat. Cukup. Mar kamu siapa? Cukup jadi. Tapi tunggu dia, ni belum tunggu. Cukup dia cakap. Saya ni zaman zaman jadi ko. Concerned that Tash may have provoked the interest of the police by talking to locals, the team immediately left the area. But the constant fear of being caught was taking its toll. And once they were well away, Tash wanted to unwind briefly by reliving a memory from his childhood. Try to catch the the little animal. They have got two holes. If you uh, blow here, the other side you hold the plastic. It's coming out. How do you know that? Because uh, I used to play uh, like this when I was uh, in Tibet. Ah, what do you do? But after a few minutes of relaxation, the team was sharply reminded of the challenges they faced when Tash realized that catching hamsters may have drawn unwanted attention. Bob, yeah? could you put the camera away, please? Why? There's a, a, a police car behind us, and I'm really suspected that they're following us. Having followed for some time, the police car overtook. Shortly afterwards, the team came to a roadblock. We haven't it's virtually impossible to travel freely around Tibet. This was to be the first of many checkpoints on this journey, giving direct evidence of how the Chinese control movement, one of the ways the government prevents uncensored information getting out. With tapes in the car that could lead to those on camera being arrested and imprisoned, every checkpoint was a tense encounter. This is the fourth checkpoint we have to go through today. Uh, all drivers and there's more down there as well. Really? Uh, and we, we don't want you know, them to search our luggages and find our cases. There was good reason to fear for the safety of those who had agreed to go on camera. Human Rights Watch has reported that any Tibetans who challenge Chinese authority may be subjected to detention, torture in custody, and other illegal abuses. Tash was hoping to meet with a monk who had personal experience of such treatment. He'd served several years in prison after being arrested for supporting a Free Tibet campaign. But the many checkpoints on the road meant that the team arrived too late to make the pre-arranged rendezvous. Tomorrow I'm meeting the old contact, but he's really nervous to meet in the local area, so we have to find a place I think it's worth taking risk because uh, without taking risk, you know, nobody knows what's happening, you know, down here and in, in, in Tibet. The following night, after more negotiations by phone, a safe location was agreed. The first thing the monk revealed was that some toys labelled Made in China may in fact be the products of forced labour in Tibet. <laughs> He said that if anyone doesn't complete their assigned quota, they are tortured. 
The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture says that the use of torture is still widespread in Tibet. In a report in 2006, he said methods included beating with sticks, electric shock batons, hooding and sleep deprivation. China said the report did not conform with reality and claimed the government had made effective efforts to prevent torture. Tash had been trying to make contact with others who claimed they had been tortured, but anyone who had been through the Chinese penal system was understandably nervous about discussing their experiences. One man was prepared to be filmed, on condition that a safe location to meet could be established. The next day, with a secure meeting place agreed, Tash was able to talk to a man who claims he was arrested simply for handing out pro-Tibetan leaflets. He says he was charged with splitism, a crime from the Cultural Revolution used to describe anything that challenges the authority of the Chinese government. Tikkautin ajan, että se on se, että on 
사소미가 이것씩 이줄이 돼도 또는 니게 티가 그게 이제 맞던데. 어떻게 해도고. 어떻게 해도 되고. 좀 하나 안 되는 미제는 나 하세요. Despite years of torture and imprisonment, this man is determined to continue to fight the Chinese. More recently, he has been investigating the government's population control policies. Tash Despa has now been in Tibet for over two months investigating life under Chinese rule. After talking to forcibly resettled nomads and those who say they've suffered torture and arbitrary arrest, he is now investigating another way in which the Chinese allegedly attempt to control the Tibetan population. I'm on the way to meet a lady who, are like many women, uh, had a full sterilization and she's very nervous. So we had to go to at night so that nobody can see us. So far, we have been very, very lucky to speak to these people without any problems with the uh, police. So we're ho hoping it will go very smoothly tonight. The house should be down here, so we're nearly there. I can see the lights. She says she had a child out of quota under the terms of China's one-child policy. As a result, she was given the choice of either a fine she couldn't pay or sterilization. <laughs> And <laughs> Sorry, 
The Chinese government says the one-child policy does not apply to Tibetans. But this woman's experience is far from unique. In 2002, a UN special rapporteur said women in Tibet are subjected to forced sterilization, forced abortion, coercive birth control policies, and the monitoring of menstrual cycles. China is able to exert this intimidating control over the people of Tibet, partly through sheer numbers. Migrant workers from China have flooded into the capital in recent years, encouraged by the government. Official business has to be conducted in Mandarin, so Tibetans are at a significant disadvantage. As a result, observers estimate that around half the population of Lhasa is now Han Chinese, and the vast majority of businesses are Chinese-owned. It was these shops and offices that bore the brunt of Tibetan anger in the protests over recent weeks. On condition that he was interviewed well away from the city, a man has agreed to talk about how the Chinese are dominating business and commerce. He feels that through linguistic and bureaucratic barriers, ethnic Tibetans are being excluded. <laughs> Since the railway connecting Lhasa to Beijing opened in 2006, Tibetans fear the process of sinusization has been accelerated because it has become easier for Han Chinese to settle here. It's also been claimed that the railway is used to export minerals and raw materials to China's industrial heartland to fuel the country's economic growth and to satisfy the West's desire for cheap Chinese-made goods. China is harnessing the huge potential for hydroelectric power in Tibet as well, not only to provide power for the region, but also for elsewhere in China. Hundreds of dams have been built and numerous valleys flooded. According to pressure groups, these projects have often been carried out with little regard for the local population. They sometimes know nothing until the flood waters start to rise. The inhabitants of this old people's home had only a few hours to rescue what they could before everything that remained was lost beneath the rising waters. But controlling Tibet's water is not only about hydroelectric power. Ten of Southeast Asia's main rivers rise in Tibet, including the Indus, the Brahmaputra and the Mekong. There are now dams in all their basins. With the climate in Tibet believed to be changing more quickly than anywhere else in the world, glacial melt is on the increase. So as fresh water becomes more scarce, the value of water sources will increase. With water, minerals and oil in the region, Tibet's oil reserves are estimated to be worth around $4 trillion. It is unlikely China will loosen control. So far, the team had managed to avoid the attention of Chinese security. But when a group of American protesters flew an anti-Chinese banner on Mount Everest, Surveillance on foreigners was significantly tightened everywhere. 
Tash had arranged to meet a student active in the Free Tibet movement, but because of the increased security, he got nervous and pulled out. A few months ago, he was helping a monk to find a, a new place because the monk was new here. And then, after a few days, the security came to him saying that don't contact with monks. I thought he was definitely going to talk to me. And I was really confident, but I didn't know he was being watching and following. So today I spoke to him and he said that he has been followed and, uh, you know, watching. So, so I'm glad <laughs> he didn't talk. Does that make you worried at all that you're being watched? Yes. Because I've met lots of people, you know, who I don't know and uh, don't really know, but, and uh, so maybe, you know, one of them is spy and is still watching me. You know, I should be really careful now. I've got to be nervous now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Fear of the security forces is ever present in Tibetan life, and because monks have so much influence on the Tibetan community, they are especially closely monitored. Whenever a large gathering takes place, the troops move in. This secretly shot footage from a religious ceremony in 2006 clearly shows how the Chinese make sure their presence is felt. Soldiers constantly search the crowd and very obviously film everyone there. In mainland China, it's thought that there is one soldier for every 1,400 citizens. In Tibet, the estimate is one Chinese soldier for every 20 Tibetans. The capital, Lhasa, is as far as most tourists get. Here they head for the monasteries. As they take photographs of the monks going about their daily routines, few realize the degree of control being exercised all around them. Despite this, Tash managed to make contact with a monk who was willing to talk about the lack of religious freedom in the monasteries. Tash wore a hidden camera so no one would know the monk was being filmed. When the US criticized China for limiting religious freedom, the Chinese government stated that such accusations were unfounded and unreasonable and that all citizens enjoy full religious freedom. But monks in Tibet say they don't have freedom of worship and are forced to attend meetings where they are taught that the state must always take precedence and that they must renounce allegiance to the Dalai Lama. Another young Tibetan said that in the education system too, minor acts of protest are met with heavy punishment. <laughs> Susugi 
It had taken almost three months living undercover in Tibet for Tash to gain the trust of those who had eventually agreed to be interviewed. After that long living with the tensions of possible discovery, Tash was beginning to understand the paranoia of local Tibetans about the army in their midst. Before leaving, he shared his thoughts about the Chinese. To live like here is, a, is it's, it's like I live in a hell, you know? As everybody knows, and they don't have freedom, they don't have a human rights, you know? Monks, they don't have a, a religion's freedom, of course, the normal general people as well. So, I think this is a terrible, terrible thing and, and the, the world should know about this, what Chinese people, you know, government doing to Tibetan. Within days of the riots, Tash secured these disturbing images of Tibetan protesters who appear to have been shot through the heart. The Chinese put the death toll at 22 people, claiming most have been killed by rioters. The Tibetan government in exile says that up to 140 Tibetans have been killed by Chinese security forces. As the riots died down, armed troops were rounding up suspects. Hundreds have reportedly been arrested. The country was then quickly locked down and little information then got out. Though when a group of journalists were given an escorted tour of Lhasa, their briefing was invaded by a group of 30 monks shouting that Tibet is not free. We put our findings to the Chinese embassy in London. Their spokesman said, the embassy has not been given sufficient time to investigate these allegations, but this programme is not serious and not objective, and as a result, not worthy of comment. Tibetans still largely remain loyal to the Dalai Lama, and his influence was clear to see as only a handful of the hundreds of peaceful protests turned violent. But with the presence of the Olympic torch already proving highly controversial in London, Paris and beyond, as the eyes of the world turn to Beijing, this generation of Tibetans is learning that more direct action can capture the world's attention. Unless the world starts to pay attention to the human rights abuses taking place in Tibet, it would seem that the Dalai Lama's 49-year campaign of non-violence may be under threat. <laughs> If somebody bullying, you know, the other, one of other every day, what would you do? If you, you know, you're going to, you know, let him bullying your whole life. 
or are you going to fight him back one day? <laughs>